So going off of what we talked about yesterday, and yesterday was a very interesting and lovely conversation about autism and ADHD and cures and whether or not your autism is a part of your personality, part of your consciousness. And so I don't think my consciousness is neurodivergent. I think neurodivergency is something in a way how my brain processes things, but I don't think my consciousness is my brain. So everyone has a different relationship with this. For some people, their brain is their consciousness. Their consciousness is their personality. I asked my sibling, who has autism, if they felt like getting rid of their autism would get rid of who they are. And they actually said, yes. They said that if I cured in quotation marks, my autism, then I would feel like, who was I then? Now I am not married to the person that I am. So if you cured my borderline and cured all my stuff, like my sibling asked me like, okay, if you could get rid of your stuff, would you do it? I was like, yeah, bro. In a heartbeat, give me the pill. Give me the fucking pill. <laughs> give me the pill. Like, I know I'm an animal evolved over time. I'm here on this planet a very short time. Give me the fucking pill. But the difference is that for me, I'm not tied to this person that I am. I know I've changed enough as a person. I know I transform all the time. I'm not married to my ideas, my ideologies, my values, or my morals. I think they're important to the person that I am. But if I was a different person, I wouldn't be married to them in the same way. So it doesn't matter. Now, with that said, I want to make sure that it's clear that we are a neurodivergent safe space here in a very particular way. We do philosophy and introspection, which means you are going to have to answer very difficult questions and you are going to maybe get a little offended or sensitive about the subject matter. And if that happens, you're absolutely welcome to voice that concern or that anxiety. You're absolutely welcome to take a break and come back. I just want to make sure when we're having this conversation, we are not here to devalue the sanctity of life or the dignity around life. But you guys also know I'm pro-choice. So obviously, in some ways, we're okay with... <laughs> we're in some ways okay with ending a human life, you know? So ultimately, we're talking about a, a hypothetical, mythical land in which you could give somebody a, quote, cure for autism or ADHD or whatever neurodivergency you want to talk about. But in no way, shape or form are we talking about un, like unloving the people who have it or that the people who have it aren't lovable or important or that we wouldn't fight for them or that their life is meaningless because they have neurodivergency. Like no, nobody's saying anything like that. Recently, I reviewed a video from The Thought Spot who I really, really like. And The Thought Spot does content on autism. And it was about introspection and how autism can be a superpower to some people. And in the comment section of my video, people were upset that we were mostly speaking about people with autism one and not autism three or high support autism or what people used to call low functioning autism. And I think that they have a right to be upset. Now, growing up in the generation that I did in the bubble I was in, the only representation you got was quote, low functioning or high support autism. So anyone who was autism one was ignored as fake. So now we are trying to show, show more representation of like low support autism. But if you're low support autism, depending on the bubble you're in, you either have no representation and people think you're faking or you have so much representation, people forget that autism can be a, disa a disability. So there's some relationship with sort of what lens you're viewing this very large spectrum on. Doom says, should I accept the fact that my brother will always be this way then? I keep thinking time will do its work and cure him, but it's not looking too hot right now and he's 16. Yeah, there, there. it's not about a cure. It's about learning to live with the uniqueness of your consciousness, your body, your brain, your, your processing uniqueness, right? So it's not about holding out for a cure. It's about learning that the reality is if your sibling, family member, people in your life have low or high support, sorry, high support autism, and they need a lot of care and love that you might be the sibling who takes care of them after your parents pass away. The reality is it's lots of people and I've met so many unique souls, you know, to this day have high support autism needs and their siblings will absolutely be their caregivers when their parents pass. And that is just the reality of some people's lives. And so again, if that is your situation, then I would start financially preparing to take care of your sibling and loving them because they're still a unique consciousness who deserves that love. Britt says, did you talk about love on the spectrum yesterday? I binged the new season. I haven't watched it, but I'm so excited. And we actually have a video from Abby today. So we're going to watch a video from Abby on TikTok. And then we're going to go into um, another TikTok that I found that I thought we could talk about. So Abby is from Love on the Spectrum. And Abby is somebody who I really, really respect. And honestly, she's so introspective. It's kind of beautiful to watch. But Abby feels trapped. She wishes she didn't have autism. She feels like the little mermaid who's stuck inside of a body 
and she can't get her voice out. Abby has said many times she wished she didn't have autism because it keeps her feeling like she's in a cage. Now, I think that's an incredibly valid and important representation of people on the spectrum. Some people love their autism and feel like without my autism, who would I be? And for other people, they feel trapped by their autism. And I think there's something so important about having that conversation because I think it also moves into the conversation around having children and needing support for those kids. I'm sure Abby's mother is doing the work right now to make sure that Abby isn't abandoned when she passes. That is a huge, huge fear for so many parents who have extremely disabled and or kids who have, you know, more needs. And I think ignoring that is sort of like very inhumane and undignified because these babies need somebody to, to take care of them. And so if you're the kind of person who has autism and you can function in a way where you don't need a caretaker, that's amazing. But also, what does that mean? I know people with autism who graduated college, who can get jobs, who can get themselves around the city, and they still cannot for the life of them, figure out how to make it within the world and they have to live with their parents. They're in their 40s. They're in their 50s. They can't actually live on their own. And when their parents die, I hope their parents leave them a house. Otherwise, they're going to be another homeless adult on the streets. So again, when we talk about whether or not we should cure autism, we aren't talking about getting rid of human beings with autism. We're talking about whether or not autism is universally experienced and then whether or not people have a type of autism, if you want to call it that, in which, which it's not, that's not the right terminology, but you know what I mean, in which taking a pill would be a life-saving medical intervention for them. I think that's something that we need to have a conversation about. This is a recent um, social interaction that Abby had to endure. And I thought her telling the story was pretty pertinent. So I'm with Abby here and we're going to talk about what happened in the grocery store today mm -hmm. to help people understand autism. How's that? Yes. So Abby was at the grocery store mm -hmm. buying some, some groceries with her helper. Right. And you, what happened? You accidentally bumped into a woman's cart and she said, what are you, a frick effing idiot? She said, are you a fucking idiot? <laughs> yes, Mary told me. Her mom. And I just want to say, how did you feel after she said that? My feelings were hurt. Right. And didn't it hurt you, my feelings. Mm -hmm. It connected it connected you to autism, feeling like it was because you had autism, she said that, huh? And it wasn't. It just made me uncomfortable. It made you uncomfortable. And what did it make you feel after you left the store? Running away. You felt really sad, huh? And I called her. You know what I called her? I called her. I, I, I should have said to you, are you an old hag? <laughs> she is an old hag, all right. Are you the sea witch? Are you Mufasa's brother? So I'm with Abby. Are you Mufasa's brother, bro? <laughs> Burn. Abby's so unintentionally. She's so fucking funny, bro. Oh, she's not even unintentionally funny. That's intentional as fuck. That's so funny. Are you Mufasa's brother, bro? Okay. I like that she said this woman called me a fucking idiot and it hurt my feelings. And I initially thought it was because I was I have autism, but it's actually because I'm just a person who made a mistake and this woman was mean to me. And I think that it's so important because so much in life, when we process why people are upset with us, sometimes we do think it's our autism or our neurodivergency or our queerness or our skin color. We do think it's about our gender or we're like, oh, it's about this thing that I have trauma in relation to, but they don't know that about you. They're just expressing their anger and how they feel and they don't have it within themselves to understand that sometimes people bump carts right? So it was just a rude person. Abby ran into a rude person. Shay Mary says, can you look at this TikTok about this autistic son hit his mom over not going to Applebee's? Actually, that's why we're having this conversation today because we had that conversation about autism yesterday, which I think was really important. And I think we, um, I told, you know, I was talking to my partner about it and all of a sudden on TikTok, here comes this video exactly representing the other part of autism, which is the scary part, the part where parents are shorter, tinier, weaker than their kids, the part where their kids are having problem with verbal communication and decide to be physically violent towards their parents unintentionally, like the kids are not being malicious. The, the adults, the people with autism are not being malicious. They are just limited with their tools of how to express themselves. So let's go ahead and watch that video. Applebee's door. Yeah, have Applebee's. 
No cash. today you can have hot dog pancakes Dead. or pizza Applebee's. no we can go to Applebee's on Wednesday um the Applebee's right. Applebee's restaurant Wednesday today hot dogs pancakes or pizza. Mm, do you oh no what which one do you want no no no! Okay. No! Mm -mm. Are you oh hungry? no! Okay, are you hungry or bored? No. Okay. Are you um, hungry? Mm -mm. Yes mm -mm. or no? Mm -mm. Or do you want to do something fun? No. Okay. Okay. Do food or, um do for a walk? Mm -mm. No. Jump. Jump. Would you like to go jump? Uh-uh. No. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Alright. We've got to figure out something. Cash. No. Cash. Hey. Deep breath. Blow. Good job. Okay, we have to have safe hands. Did you? Yeah, safe Did. hands. Ah! Get our hot, hot dogs out. <laughs> Applebee store. No Applebee's today. Applebee store. Applebee's on Wednesday. Do you? Mm -mm. Today we can go to the park or go for a walk. No. Okay. Uh, hey, mommy, mommy, my I love you. Hey, can we count to ten? One, two, three. Applebee's. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Ay, ay, ay. Apple Store. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Apple Store. Obviously, major props to mom. She did really, really well. I think that's first and foremost. We have one more TikTok we're going to watch in relation to this in a second. But major props to mom. She did really, really well. Super compassionate, very loving, very much understanding it's not personal. <coughs> he's not actually trying to hurt his mother, right? She, he's just expressing himself with the limited tools he has. And those tools are, you know, coming out in a way that is, you know, possibly hurtful in a physical or emotional way. Super strong mom, right? Like, I just want to cry watching it because it must be so painful as a parent to watch a kid be so... Um, expressive and obviously very much there, but also very limited in their capacity to explain their presence. So I heavily believe that this this person, um, I don't know how old he is, but that he has a consciousness and that there is a voice within him that is operating and having a dialogue, maybe to some extent, that isn't able to express itself. And so I think that that is what I am interested in. When we talk about a cure for autism, we're not talking about people with autism being bad. We're talking about people with autism having different tools and giving them more tools and also our own selves. Even if you're neurotypical, you are going to be limited um, when it comes to tools, depending on the environment you're raised in, depending on your genetics, depending on so many other things. So again, I want to make sure that when we're watching this, we're humanizing the situation because so many people um, are afraid of autism. And I don't think that's how you should approach it. I don't think you have to be afraid of it. It's not a like a woo, it's okay. It is a way that some human beings process life. And so we have to have a conversation about that processing, right? Mappy says, are parents in these situations taken care of pretty well by the government? <laughs> Absolutely not. I hope they are because doing this while also having to work just pains me to think about it. No, they're not. There's absolutely zero resources. 
if he outlives her, which he probably will, he will go, he will become homeless. Or if she is lucky, she will save up enough money to put him in a care facility. There absolutely is not the resource for this. Now, we are better equipped now to handle it, but it's not good. And so, again, he's probably going to end up with a family members. Uh, maybe a church will take him in. Maybe a home will take him in and fund them. But no, she's not being funded. And she probably is working. And she's probably maybe living off disability, which is nothing, by the way. So. Again, when we're having these conversations, I don't want her son to be put in a home where he's going to be hurt or tortured or misunderstood. I don't want people because people will get burnt out. They will put your kids in solitary confinement or your elderly. They will abuse them because they get burnt out and they don't have that extra layer of loving the consciousness to allow them to be patient the way this mother is patient. So my concern, right, my huge concern is that obviously this is a disability, this person is experiencing a disability, and this is one way to experience autism in the world, and it can be very, very difficult. But my biggest concern is like, where are we going to put those kids who become adults who can't care for themselves after their parents pass? And if you don't have family members to take care of them, what are you going to do? And then even if you do have family members, it's really difficult because I think we are animals evolved over time to to prioritize someone else's offspring over your own when that offspring is exhibiting like harmful behavior or possibly threatening behavior. Obviously, even though he's adorable and I'm sure very sweet, I wouldn't leave him alone with a child. I maybe wouldn't even leave him alone with an animal. I don't think those those little creatures can have the patience or the communication skill to, to calm him down the way the mom can. And then look at how patient she is. This is a full-time job, Right. So again, I think there, I have read so many blogs from parents. Like I read this one blog from a parent or I read the story about a, a same thing, a daughter with autism over like very tall daughter, like very tall and very big. And she would basically, she broke her mom's arm, broke her mom's nose. And it, they felt so bad that they had to put her into a home. And I think that there's a reason that that must be so devastating as parents to have to do that, right? To put them in a home because you just know it's not going to be the most fulfilling space for your child. But if we had, if I had an abundance of money, if there was an abundance of resources, I feel like this is the part of the population that needs our help the most. And I think that's so difficult because this part is so clearly in need of help and they still won't get it. And then on top of that, if you have an invisible illness or an illness that isn't represented or an illness that isn't seen as viable, or if you have anything else, then you're even more without resources. But maybe, I don't know, there's this conversation to be had about like who deserves more of the resource, right? Some people think the people who are the most equipped to be a part of society deserve all the resources and the people who aren't should be bred out. Some people think like the people with the least amount of resources should be getting the most help. I kind of take protect the weak stance more than protect the strong stance myself because I, I believe in the strong's ability to care for themselves. But I do think we should provide for the weak and I don't think it's wrong to be weak and I don't think it's wrong to ask for help and I don't think it's wrong to be somebody who needs more resources if you're given a unique situation. Now, with that said, let's look at this video, which is a reply to this video. So back before I started teaching, I used to be a registered behavioral technician and this is the population that I used to work for. So I dealt with behaviors just like this, aggressive behaviors. But this is also where I learned that behavior is a form of communication. And so this young man is trying to communicate what he wants. And then a lot of times, especially in people who are neurodivergent, they get overwhelmed. And kids, they also get overwhelmed. And because they may not have the best way to communicate or articulate what they're feeling, sometimes it comes out as aggression. So this mother is doing a phenomenal job at recognizing that this is a behavior, establishing a boundary, communicating as effectively as she possibly can, bridging the gap between both of their understanding and then holding firm with what she's saying. It is beautiful. So when we're working with our children, whether they are young, whether they are older, the goal is to communicate. Recognize that their, their behavior is a form of communication. Recognizing that even aggression, disrespect, etc., are all forms of communication. And our job is to figure out what they're trying to communicate and give them the tools and the skills and the practice 
to use it uh, to communicate more effectively, more uh, beneficially. And notice how she's standing. She's not aggressive. She's not trying to take it personally. She's taking a defensive yet firm stance. This is kind of what you want to do because they're having a meltdown and they're looking for security. And so even though he's all over the place, she's making sure she's standing firm with what she's doing and she's holding her boundary. I love this. Even when he gets frustrated, even when he's getting overwhelmed and he's stemming, she's still holding firm. You can do that. And notice she's not getting mad. Of course, it's hard because God knows I've had my hands, mm -hmm. had kids put their hands on me. I have seen neurotypical parents with neurotypical kids whoop their kids for just giving them a side eye. The amount of patience you have to have for this, she's standing her ground, but she's not, she's not taking it personal. She knows her kid isn't literally trying to hurt her. She knows he's just expressing himself with his limited tools. So often but she's killing it. Good job to mom for establishing boundaries, for holding firm, for communicating, for validating how he feels, for being a good, good parent that's recognizing how to communicate. I love this so much. Yeah, super, super great to see. Again, the mom utilizing the tools she has. I really hope she's well-funded. I hope she has the ability to not feel too stressed. You know, I know a lot of the time there's just not enough resources for people in this position, right? It's just interesting. And that's why I think, you know, the nuance of respecting boundaries, the nuance of consent, the nuance of helping, there's so much that goes into this, right? So again, when we're having the conversation about would we cure autism, and then somebody with low support autism says, who would I be without my autism? That's a great question. Who would you be without it? Who would he be without his autism? You know, and I do personally, and this is my belief, I don't have autism. I've never been diagnosed with it. I have a sibling with autism, siblings with ADHD. I need to get assessed probably for ADHD. I all get assessed for a lot of things. But particularly when I think about my habits of feeling a need to mask or my habits of stimming or my habits of doing all these kinds of things that I'm doing, I am still able to have a pretty functional life in the world. And even though people think I'm weird and even though people raise an eyebrow at me, it's not enough that I can't function. I can get a job. People trust me. I'm good. At the same time, with all the problems I have, I would take a magical pill that would eradicate all those problems I have. So I could be a version of myself that was most efficient for the limited time I'm on earth because I know I'm going to die. So I don't take it personal when someone says like, do you want to cure your autism or do you want to cure your neurodivergency? What they're asking is, do you want to have a different type of tool to have a different relationship with your consciousness? Because I believe his consciousness exists. I believe this is my belief. I believe this kid has a consciousness that exists. And on top of that consciousness, there is the autism. But for some people, they feel like their autism is their consciousness. But are you telling me this is this kid's consciousness? This is all there is to this kid? Or are you saying it's a processing issue and if he didn't have that issue, he would have a different relationship with his consciousness? And so that's the conversation I want to have, you know. Patty says I would eradicate my ADHD immediately if I could. Cherry says this has been so interesting so far. I love that Brittany humanizes those with autism of all kinds. I feel like people heavily disregard those with higher needs. Well, okay, so that's my concern is that some freak is going to see my live stream and think like, oh, yes, the autists, down with the autists. Like, I will fight for everyone with autism, okay, against everyone who's neurotypical right now. I'll body slam you, WWE, okay? I obviously want people to be dignified, okay? And to have dignity in life, we must see humans as nuanced, complex, yet simple creatures. And we are all those things. We're all simple, but we are all very complex. And somebody who has higher needs support, in my opinion, is the part of society that we should be creating the best world for. Like if I could take all of our resources, I would put it into everybody with incredible like disabilities, needs, like processing issues. I would just like make the safest space for those people. And I would give it directly to the kids. There would be like heavy regulation. So parents couldn't abuse it because not all parents who have children are good people. This mom, superwoman, but a lot of parents who have kids, neurotypical or not, okay, are not good people or good parents. So obviously, hu hu like heavy, heavily regulated. I would want to make sure that we're protecting the people who are the weakest, which is a common like superhero like philosophy question, right? Should we protect the weak or should the weak protect themselves? Should we uplift the strong? We should uplift the strong and uplift the weak. The weak don't stay weak for their whole lives. Not in the way that you think or process. The way you show dignity 
is to know that the weak can be strong in their own complex way. And that the strong are naturally strong in their own way. Most people who are strong also took the easiest path to get there. I really believe that. I believe for all of my successes and all of the hard work that I do, I choose the easiest path. I think we all do because it makes it makes no sense not to choose it. Now, in some ways, David Goggins, going back to his philosophy on ADHD, which is no medication and power through use willpower, you could argue he's choosing the easiest path for himself, but also the most inefficient path because he's suffering needlessly, right? So there's something about that as well. There is something about that to be said. So Again, this conversation is very, very layered, right? March says, but how do you decide which weakness needs priority over others? It's never perfect. I will never ask for perfection. I will never ask you or myself to be perfect. I will never ask any system to be perfect. I will ne never ask any government body to be perfect. I will never ask a school to be perfect. I will never ask anybody to be perfect. So you value harm reduction and resources and bubbles come into play. Some people want to advocate for the thing that they feel connected to. Okay, everyone should be advocating for the things that are needed on the same, with the same passion. I don't think you need to say like, these people deserve less attention than these people so much as all of our groups should be focusing on our communities and uplifting our communities because they all have different needs, right? So instead of saying like, should we fight for um, black civil rights? <laughs> And a police, a police oppression, or should we fight for kids with autism? It's like, yes. They're two different, like, people. And then what if you're black and you have autism? It's like, okay. You know what I mean? You're fighting racism and ableism. So I think your communities should fight for those things within reason. But ultimately, I do think we're animals evolved on a planet. I don't think there's moral objectivity. I don't think you are, you should be forced to help the weak or help the strong. I don't think you should be forced to do anything for the most part. I think you should, in general, as an individual, live a life that brings you closest to your joy and furthest from evil. Evil, not the construct that humanity usually talks about it, meaning the thing that I think is bad. Evil, meaning the furthest thing from joy. Celia says, I think part of the problem with the possibility of a cure, that it would eliminate any possibility of support. I know that's barely is any now so there wouldn't be an option for anyone just to cure. Well, again, the cure would be a hypothetical. It's not even real, right? But if there was one, it'd be a magical one in which it wouldn't be about maybe forcing people to take it, but giving them the option. And then that's the problem. If you choose to be disabled and to stay disabled, do you still get community efforts towards your disability? If you choose to be deaf or blind and it's a real choice, like maybe you decide to live that way or maybe decide not to get a cochlear implant, the question is, um, does the government need to fund you as a person with disabilities, right? Should we aspire to have everybody the least disabled possible and the most abled bodied? And then if you're abled bodied, does that make you, um, does that make you obligated to then participating in society? And that's a, like, these are very heavy, very big, very long conversations to be had, but I just want to throw ideas out with you guys and have those conversations very loosely while keeping in mind that I do believe in the dignity of life, I personally believe in a soul. I don't consider myself religious. I consider myself an atheist, but I do believe the consciousness is separate from the functionality of the body. I do think like what makes you you is unique, but I don't think you're very special. I just think you're one of a kind, which you could argue is a form of special. March says, I don't think people are able to focus on immediate community. I think there's a cognitive dissonance that people like to avoid what's in front of them. That's true. People tend to enjoy fighting for things really outside their scope and making it bigger than it is like global warming or, or this or that or this or that. It's because it's about, oh, this is so beyond me. This is so much bigger than me. But if you have to face, that's why people don't like introspection. And the same for the same reason, your communities will always struggle is the same reason introspection is so hard. It is hard to face your own community and the problems in it. It is also hard to face the, the problems within yourself. So remember, this is a philosophy channel. This isn't a political one. I don't care about your politics, political solutions. Your political solutions are useless in a world that is not introspective, right? Philosophy wise, the reason, the same reason you can't help your communities is the same reason you can't help yourself. We do not want to admit that there is chaos in our homes, in our spirits. Yubi says, I think if a person is able-bodied and able-minded, that there are a few things that you could expect from said person on a generalized basis. I think that's probably true. 
I think though I believe in the individual so hard they still want them to live a life that to us might feel like a waste and I think you have the right to waste your life so there's other also that perspective of like what looks like a waste to somebody else could be a thriving for somebody else so I, I want them to kind of have that option as well I think there's a an assumption that oh you can't participate in, in community because you're disabled which is not true right but let's say that's the assumption. Oh, you can't participate in a community because you're disabled. Oh, but if you're not disabled, now you're going to participate. It's like, no, just because you're able body doesn't mean you have to participate. And then what does it mean to not participate within society? Well, that means different things to different bubbles. It could mean that you're choosing not to pay tax. You're choosing not to vote. You're choosing not to participate in communities. It could mean you're choosing just to work a dead end job and not do anything else with your life. But who cares? You know what I mean? Like I said, I think the world would be fine working minimum wage jobs and quote normal people jobs if they got paid enough and they could have the life they wanted. The dilemma is also that humans want more than what they have often because they don't have a piece within their consciousness. So that also plays into how society ends up forming, which is a society of give me more, give me more, give me more, which is why some cultures around the world see more uh peace or happiness amongst their people because they're less in the consumerism bubble like America is as an example surprise says if I could take a pill to cure my ADHD and autism I think for me personally I would take it because I struggle with relationships and it's my biggest um my biggest being lonely with no prospects that's the only why mm. but you know what's funny is even if you're neurotypical you might not have a relationship so then that begs the question if you okay here here's the question so for you surprised, would you take the pill knowing you'd be neurotypical and still single? Because neurotypical people also struggle to have relationships. It's just a different struggle. It's a different why, right? The reason you struggle might be, you know. Yaya says, did you see my question? If not, can you scroll up a bit? I did not see it, but let me go find it, Yaya. And if your child can't make the decision because they don't have the mental capacity to understand, do you go against their bodily autonomy? Ultimately, you are responsible for your offspring. Depending on the context, I do think you're obviously obligated to your offspring, especially if they have cognitive disabilities. And I do think that it is your obligation as a parent to set that kid up uh, for a future without you. The same you would with a kid who was able-bodied, uh, and completely like capable, you would set that kid up to live without you. So ultimately we're doing the same things, whether our kids are disabled or able bodied, we're saying we're going to set you up to be able to live without me because I'm your parent and that's what I'm going to do for you. Da 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 da